discussion and for um, the seminars. Um, so, so welcome everyone. Um, thank you all for coming February 15th at 2 p.m. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you all here. Unfortunately, Lisa, um, who normally runs this uh, seminar series, um, was uh, unable to attend. So I get the honor of introducing our two speakers for today's seminars. Um, what I wanna just start off with, something that Lisa always tries to remind us of, which I think is important, is what is the purpose of this particular seminar series? And it really is, um, you know, it's aimed towards bringing together a community that can begin to collate um, information about the importance of um, FC effector biology and vaccines and monoclonal uh, therapeutic design, and to really start to think about how we can utilize this information, this incredible large body of knowledge that has been accumulated by many of the speakers on this call and many of the attendees in the audience and many others in the global um, community, uh, immunology and genetics community, to begin to think about how we can leverage this biology in an active process as we think um, forward to the next pandemic, or even to thinking about developing tools um, against other potential infectious and non-infectious threats. So there are three major goals for this particular seminar series. The first, of course, is to think about how antibodies induced by antigens like vaccines or from monoclonal antibodies, how they leverage the particular functions um, uh, that are important for fighting these diseases. Um, number two, to think about um, you know, how we can start to think about how we can leverage this biology. And really we're trying to come up with actionable uh, mandates at the end of the seminar series about how we can begin to implement this knowledge and utilize this knowledge. And third is to really think about how we can use this workshop to really bring the community together, to really begin to engage in collaborative research um, and to keep the, I think the um, incredible collaborative spirit that we felt over the last three years alive um, as we build new tools uh, to fight other potential pathogens and diseases. So with that, hopefully that summarizes what the goal is of this particular seminar. And we'll go right into our uh, next two speakers. Oh, and before that, maybe I can just say, sorry, thank, thanks, um, Courtney, is that there are two groups um, that have been brought together um, under this um, effector function uh, effort. Um, the first on the left side that is really geared towards understanding how we can standardize effector assays so we can begin to apply these to monoclonal therapeutic design and vaccine development. Um, this is a group that's led by Annie. Um, and the idea here is to bring a collection of individuals. We have a few of the individuals listed on the slide here. If you're in the audience and you're interested, please do email us because we hope to capture all the voices um, in the community to try to think through how we can begin to create these assays that can be informative as we move forward into the next you know, generation of therapeutics that will leverage this biology and not just the binding capabilities of antibodies. And on the right side, we have the translation preclinical effector function and clinical COVID experience group, um, which I'm helping to lead, um, which essentially is a group that comes together to think about how we can create those actionable um, you know, I, I ideas that can move forward to guide the community in the future um, as we think about utilizing this biology uh, in next-gen design. Okay, so with that um, uh, in mind, we'll go to the next slide. Next slide, and it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, next two speakers. Um, and so it's it's really a pleasure. Um, we have um, our first speaker. Okay, I'll start off with Mike. Um, so Dr. Diamond um, is really just I think. Um, a pillar in the FC community. I think he is one of the groundbreakers. He is one of the uh, folks in the, the community of the FC effector function that really forces us to think about the FC domain in a different way. Mike's lab is at, um, at, the, at Washington University um, in St. Louis. Um, and Mike's lab really focuses on understanding the molecular mechanisms and biological effector functions that are relevant to the control of many different viruses, including SARS-CoV-2. And Mike really by utilizing sophisticated animal model systems, really modeling the biology of different infectious diseases has really led the forefront and probably most, some of the most cutting edge efforts um, in the community, helping us to understand how antibiotics Antibodies provide protection against different viruses and different diseases, and more importantly, how those antibodies interact with the immune system to mediate their ultimate effector or, or uh, function in controlling that pathogen. Um, so Mike has um, numerous papers. I can't even count them. I think I, I think you're like in the 
multi, multi, multi hundreds. Mike is a member of uh, many academies. I'm not going to go through his entire CV. It's really just um, an incredible list. Um, Mike has led the effort on many of the um, Flavy viruses. He's gone into alpha viruses. He's helped us understand many of the uh, SARS -CoV of the co coronaviruses, influenza. The virus list just really doesn't end. And so it's really a pleasure to have Mike here today to help us really think through how FCF vector functions are critical in the battle against SARS CoV 2. And hopefully, Mike will also share at the end with his thoughts on how we can begin to implement and extend this knowledge into the design of next gen vaccines and monoclonal therapeutic design. So Mike, thank you for being here and the podium is yours. Okay, um, thank you Galit for the very, very super generous introduction. <laughs> um, I appreciate uh, what you said, obviously as both a friend and a, and a colleague, uh, it was very, very nice of you. Um, oops, I guess I wanted this up here. You guys can all see this, I presume, in the correct mode. So um, my talk today is going to be on FC effector functions in the context of antibody protection against SARS-CoV-2. And um, um, I I'll say that, as we know, but not strange to this community, but of course, to the other communities outside, the focus has really been on neutralizing antibodies. And I, I think to some degree, of course, that's been appropriate there, especially early on in the pandemic, when um, highly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies and vaccine-derived antibodies were generated against the receptor binding domain uh, and the receptor binding motif to block ACE2 interactions, as well as to block, probably block other entry and fusion-related interactions. And all of the early candidates that we had, many of them actually bound up here on the RBM or to the RBD and were protective. Um, but it has become increasingly clear that we need to think beyond this, not only if you're drinking the Kool-Aid as part of this particular workshop, but really more generally speaking, that um, that while neutralization is certainly an important component it, and can be a dominant component, especially in the context of variants, as we move along to where we lose neutralizing activity, we still can retain protective activity and possibly optimize that protective activity through some of the other functions here. And of course, the other functions are well characterized just generically, meaning that FC interactions can promote phagocytosis, cellular cytotoxicity, complement deposition, antigen presentation, and others. But really trying to understand in the context of protection, either that's uh, passively transferred or active immunization, what are the FC effector functions that actually can modulate this? And what should we really be thinking about in the context of trying to, as Galit said, trying to move forward and design new types of antigens uh, and new types of assays to be able to, to figure this out, where we optimize effector function that's protective, but don't necessarily get perhaps some of the pro-inflammatory conditions where which might have maladaptive responses. And so we started this project um, uh, uh, early on in the pandemic in 2020, and I'm just going to review a little bit of the monoclonal data, and then I'll move to some of the polyclonal data. Uh, just to review this, we started this work with Jim, Jim Crow's lab. Jim obviously gave a talk early on about uh, com components of the antibodies that are highly protective, uh, not only in the antibodies that were licensed to AZ ultimately, but in many others that they developed in his lab. And we were involved with Jim to, uh, at the early stages of trying to determine which ones were neutralizing and which ones were protective. He identified a whole slew from a, an initial donor that was uh, a convalescent from SARS-CoV-2 in Canada. And we were interested in trying to understand at that point what role FC effector function had. And so we, uh, with Jim, designed a la la PG variant of this, showed it could neutralize equivalently compared to its parental one, but of course lost its ability to bind both mouse and human FC receptors, in this case, mouse FCR1 and mouse FCR4, and we're using a human antibody here. So this is a bit of a hetero heterologous system, and that is a caveat uh, to some of the studies I'm going to show, and I want to, uh, I'll point that out. And what um, at the time Emma Winkler in my laboratory showed that is that if you took highly neutralizing antibodies that were RBD specific, and you administered them as a therapy, in this case, either day one, day two, or day three, the protection that we saw required FC effector functions. And the basis for the data was that if we look, let's say here at weight loss, if you just take a isotype animal, they lose about 25 to 30% of their weight over the first 10 days. And now you could get protection with the intact antibody, uh, but the LALA PG version uh, lost substantial protection against weight loss. And this also was true against uh, lethal infection in this particular model. This is in K18 transgenic mice. 
you can see that the 2052, 2050 neutralizing RBD antibody protects. If you knock off the, uh, um, uh, put that on a LALA PG, then you lose this protection and you get lethality. And this happens either at day one, day two, or even day three post-infection. So in the context of therapy, even highly neutralizing antibodies required FC effector functions for, uh, for protection. And this was against matched um, uh, matched viruses, meaning uh, uh, 2050 was derived against the Washington one uh, like virus. And then we were using that same virus or very similar virus in the context of the challenge. What um, Emma went on to show in the context of these therapeutic antibodies you, uh, and using them at a post-exposure therapy stage was that protection, which was FC dependent, FC effector function dependent, was partially a, a, a reducing viral load, but also must be contributing in some other ways. And the basis for that is when we looked at lung titers, this is the isotype antibody at, and when we administered at day plus one. If we use the intact antibody at day plus one, we could see about a hundredfold reduction. Of course, if you administered it prophylactically, you could get even bigger reduction. But of course, we're met looking at this at a therapeutic stage. But if you gave the same antibody at day plus two, now the green, there was no difference between um, the uh, lung titers in, in the uh, uh, isotype and the day, and the, uh, day plus two, even though there was a large clinical difference in both lung function, which I'm not showing you, as well as lung inflammation, as well as, uh, which I will show you a little bit, but as well as a clinical outcome. However, if you use the LALA PG variants, either at day plus one or day plus two, there was really no effect on viral load. And we saw the same thing at day eight and even intermediate time points. And so the, the wild type intact antibody, if administered very early or as prophylaxis could reduce viral load, but administered later, we lost the viral load decrease, but we still retained protection. And that was the important um, message from this. When we looked uh, at the pathology associated with this, using H&E uh, um, uh, &E staining of inflated lungs, just to sort of orient you, this is a naive animal. You can see lots of open alveolar spaces in the lung here. If you um, infect the animals, these here, all the rest of them are infected, and treat with an isotype antibody, you can see um, at this particular day that we looked, evidence of inflammation. There's some evidence of uh, 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 consolidation that's happening. If you administered the uh, neutralizing antibody one day after infection, you restored it back to the naive animal. However, if you administered this LALA PG version, which um, I showed you reduced the viral, uh, didn't reduce viral load, we got this inflammation. But I think the more important one is this comparison at day plus two, where we still see this significant beneficial effect of the antibody. There's a couple of regions that have some immune cells, but all, for the most part, we have open patent uh, alveolar spaces. Whereas here you see the 2050 LALA PG variant. We have lots of inflammation as we do sort of with the isotype here, and we lose this benefit. And so this benefit is FC dependent. What we then did were studies to figure out which cells were important in this. We used depletion studies. And um, just to sort of go through some of the data, we depleted neutrophils, we depleted NK cells. When we did this either in um, animals that had been treated with the uh, 2050 neutralizing antibody or animals that were just treated with the isotype. We didn't see any effect of NK cells or neutrophils in this particular system, in this particular model in K18 transgenic mice. We saw a small effect of CDA T cell depletion, um, uh, uh, possibly um, uh, because of the, the time course that we did this, maybe uh, there, there would be effects later, but at least at this early part of the time course, we didn't really see huge differences, but we did see big differences when we depleted monocytes. And so the protective activity of the antibody 2050, which is here, dropped based on weight loss um, if we um, uh, depleted uh, C with an anti-CCR2 antibody and depleted monocytes. And so this suggested to us that at least part of the protection mediated by the FC portion of this, which was of a neutralizing antibody when administered in the context of therapy, was a required monocytes that probably were infiltrating in and presumably either, either acting by themselves or differentiating into monocyte-derived dendritic cells or monocyte-derived um, macrophages or uh, some similar type of cell. When we looked pathologically at this, um, uh, in the context of, uh, the, again, therapeutic administration of this 2050 antibody, and now in the context of depletion with um, uh, an anti-CCR2 antibody. So just to orient you, if we just take the isotype, 
you can see we see this a significant amount of inflammation in the air spaces. These are uh, combinations of um, monocytes. There's some CDA T cells here. There are some neutrophils here as well. When we administer this at day plus one, as I showed you earlier, we get uh, very little inflammation. If we do the same thing now with the isotype and deplete CCR2, we still see significant amounts of immune cells here. These turn out to be, there's some neutrophils. We actually pick up a couple of EOs, eosinophils here, and there's some T cells here as well. But if we give this 2050 antibody and deplete monocytes, we actually see worse disease here, even though um, uh, uh, the 2050 is still present. We now see evidence of some inflammation and even some consolidation as well. And so this suggested to us that um, uh, in the context of monoclonal antibodies, um, it, when it, even though if they were highly neutralizing against a homologous virus, when administered therapeutically, there was a role for FC-dependent effector function-mediated protection to get optimal protection. Certainly, they could protect early on by themselves by virtue of their neutralizing activity, and even as prophylaxis uh, against a matched virus. But as you go further into infection, the FC effector functions become important, and that seems to be monocyte-dependent. So what about antibody protection in the setting of variants where you have inherently less neutralizing activity, where now the virus presumably is not matched against the original antibody that was generated, either that antibody being a monoclonal antibody that was generated early in the pandemic and received EUA approval, or a vaccine that was ma um, matched against uh, the original uh, Wuhan one or uh, uh, Washington one. So in the setting of the loss of neutralizing activity, does FC effector function become even more important? So this work was done by uh, two postdocs in the laboratory at the time, Brett Case and Laura Van Blarg, and Laura is now at, uh, at the NIH. And so what Laura did was she was very interested in looking at the neutralizing antibody profiles of particularly important ones, and I'll come to the ones in a minute, um, which uh, in the context of Omicron strains. And we started this with BA1, went to BA2, BA4, BA5, BQ11, XB1, XBB15. I'm going to show you just some of the data that we have, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but we did uh, sort of focus on the uh, commercially important and relevant antibodies. These two are the Evisheld combination. This is the Citrovimab parent, Regeneron, Lily, uh, et cetera. And what Laura was uh, able to show at the time, which uh, ultimately many other labs showed, including David Ho's laboratory, David Montefiore's laboratory, uh, um, a wide array of labs uh, across the world have shown is that um, in the context of these early Omicron strains, BA1, BA1.1, and BA2, we could see substantial loss of the component antibodies, either the monoclonal Sestrio 9, which is the parent of citrovimab. We see this shift over to the right uh, to less neutralizing activity. In the individual components of the AZ antibodies, we see substantial shifts to the right here of either one, uh, the other, or both here with um, BA, with different BA, uh, uh, BA, and, uh, BA Omicron strains. And of course, so now you have less neutralizing antibodies. So the question is, what happens in the context of protection and how much of that protection is, uh, re, uh, is dependent on FC effector functions? So one thing that I'll just mention parenthetically, the citrovimab um, was engineered to retain its FC effector functions, whereas the Evusheld combination, when AZ made it, there was, I guess, some concern about possible antibody immune enhancement that's my guess. And so they made mutations in it that actually abrogated FC effector functions. So these only have neutralizing activity, and presumably this has both neutralizing and FC mediated potential activity. And so when we did the study, of course, now we're in the setting of even worse uh, immune evasion. This is just to remind you that based on antigenic cartography data, data that's been published out of the whole laboratory and other laboratories, we see this movement of the XBB group, XBB15 group, away even from the BA4, BA2 group, away from the D614G, and the other groups here would be the earlier variants. And this is associated, of course, with less serum protection and really um, uh, loss, substantial loss of protective activity against many of the monoclonal antibodies that we were um, using or hopeful, hope to use. And so what was the consequence of this in the in 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 vivo studies and preclinical models? So we took um, the Evusheld combination. We obtained this directly from AstraZeneca as part of a collaboration with them. And we looked to see 
how well would these actually protect? In this case, we administered these either as uh, prophylaxis or as day plus one. I think this data is the prophylaxis data. And if you look at lung uh, viral RNA or lung infectious virus in the K18 mice using um, any of these three different viruses, early Omicron variants, you can see the D614G parent virus, this is a great combination, really shuts down infection so that you have um, about six log reduction. We lose uh, a substantial amount of the activity with BA1. We lose almost almost all the activity down to just a couple of fold uh, improvement here. It's statistically significant, but certainly um, not overwhelming. But with BA2, we actually see a restoration of this uh, a neutralized, uh, a protective activity. And this corresponded with data in infectious virus. And if you plot the data by a, a correlation, you can see that there's a direct correlation with the change in neutralizing activity compared to the original D614G and the log reduction in viral RNA. I mean, this is really a, a pre pretty remarkable line with just four points here um, with a, a really great R squared value. And this is not surprising because as I told you, this antibody has no effector functions, FC effector functions. It was gutted of them in the design phase. And so really its protection is directly related to its neutralizing activity. However, when we looked at this atrovimab parent, S309, and this was collaboration with Veer, who generated uh, this antibody, and um, uh, this also uh, uh, was done in the K18 mice with the same three variants, you can see here that the parental uh, D614G, we had great protection, just as we did um, with the Evisheld one, but now we had substantial protection. We lost a little bit, but we still had a lot of protection with BA1, BA1.1, and BA2. And this was true both at the viral RNA and the infectious virus level. And this was despite the fact that we saw um, a, a movement of the neutralization curves to the right with each of these different variants. And I didn't show the correlation curve here, but the correlation curve was not nearly as good. In fact, the line was not particularly good um, and suggesting that the neutralization alone was not a great correlate of protection as you generated these uh, variants. And so S309 protected infection regardless of the loss of neutralizing activity. We went on to make a loss of function GRLR variant. I should say Veer went on to make this, this antibody and sent it to us uh, for testing and comparing to uh, the parental antibody here. And what you can see here is that this GRLR antibody um, uh, showed some modest protection against the parental virus. So there was some neutralizing antibody dependent protection against the D614G, but we lost the protection against the BA1 and BA2, suggesting that you required the FC effector functions to get protection against the variant viruses. And this was also true, not just in K18 mice, but also in human FC receptor transgenic mice. Mm -hmm. So in this one, of course, we have mouse FC receptors. And now with this one, we have human FC receptors. We're using um, a, a slightly different virus so that it's adapted a little bit better to work in these mice. But now you can see that we don't really have much protection with this S309 GRLR, which is a loss of function um, uh, uh, antibody. But the parental antibody is able to give us substantial protection, both against viral RNA and also against um, infectious virus. So the loss of, if you lose or abrogate FC receptor uh, binding and FC receptor effector function activity, you lose protection against variant viruses, although you retain some for this antibody against uh, the parental one. And for the Evusheld, it's all dependent on uh, the uh, neutralizing activity. And of course, that's because that antibody doesn't have FC effector functions. So let me summarize this part, and then I'll just quickly go to the last part. Protection in vivo with a citrovimab parent, parent or the Evusheld antibody against all three variants. We did see protection variable, certainly with the Evusheld, uh, a little bit more so with citrovimab. The behavior of Evusheld in vivo directly related to its neutralizing activity, but the S309 did not directly relate to its activity because this antibody showed robust FC effector function activity. I didn't show the data, but through a series of in vitro assays, um, we could certainly show that there was evidence of um, uh, FC receptor engagement as well as uh, um, uh, uh, ADCP and ADCC. Studies in transgenic mice establish assays uh, uh, that show the mechanism of action against Omicron and other variants requires FC effector functions. And this suggests to us that neutralizing activity may not always be the dominant correlate of protection, especially for some uh, clinically used antibodies against variants. And so then uh, the question remains as which are the best assays that we can use in vitro that correlate with the protective phenotypes that we can see by passive transfer, whether they're against conventional mice or against F, uh, human transgenic mice. So the next question we wanted to answer is about um, 
uh, polyclonal antibody and vaccine-induced antibody. And so this work was done by Samantha Mackin, a graduate student in my laboratory. We collaborated with Moderna on this. They helped us with, uh, get good access to their mRNA vaccines, as well as some other reagents. And basically, we did some uh, a couple of different vari uh, variants on this experiment, but the one I'm going to show you is we primed animals with a vaccine. We boosted animals with the same, this is the 1273 uh, mRNA vaccine, the, uh, the original one, if you will. And then we just bled the animals and pooled the serum. And then we showed that the antibodies that we got, which were uh, dominantly against Washington 1 2020, because this was against the original spike, uh, lost a lot of activity against BA5, as you might expect, about in this case, 20-fold. If we did this against XBB15, it would be almost a 100-fold reduction uh, of neutralizing activity. But we took this antibody, which was the polyclonal antibody from serum, and then we passively transferred it to either wild-type mice FC receptor knockout mice or C1Q knockout mice, and then challenged with either closely related or more distantly related SARS-CoV-2 strains. First, we uh, looked at the serum, and so we collaborated with um, a Galitz lab uh, in, in, at the time in, uh, at the Reagan, and Galitz lab was able to show that the antibodies that we generated from the mRNA-based vaccines all had uh, class switched uh, significantly to class uh, to IgG2s. They all bound FC receptors, as you might expect, and they were quite capable of inducing ADCP and ADNP uh, responses against both the original virus, but also against uh, spikes from the original virus, but also against spikes from the BA4-5, even though the neutralizing activity was shifted to the right by about 20-fold, we saw pretty similar responses in terms of the ADCP and ADNP. We didn't see much evidence of NK cell activation. We did see evidence of complement deposition. So then we looked to see if we took that sera and then challenged now, in, in this case, we used a mouse-adapted strain that was originally developed by the Barrick Laboratory. And we used this because we were putting this in conventional B6 mice and uh, C1Q and FC receptor knockout mice. And some of the newer strains don't replicate particularly well. So we, we wanted to start off with a, a, a strain that we knew would replicate well. If we passively transferred naive serum to any of these guys, we saw no protection. If we transferred immune serum, we saw great protection in the wild type mice, excellent protection in C1Q deficient mice, but we lost substantial protection in FC receptor 134 knockout or the common gamma chain knockout here. And it's such that we saw almost similar levels of infection with naive serum and immune serum in the FC receptor um, uh, 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 gamma, common gamma chain knockout mice. So this suggested that the lower airway protection required um, that was antibody dependent because this is a passive transfer model. What required FC receptors uh, is particularly activating FC receptors. We went on to then um, look at the individual FC receptors. And so we repeated the studies, but now used FC receptor one knockout, FC receptor two knockout, FC receptor three knockout, the common gamma chain knockout. We, we don't, we still, we've been trying to acquire the FC receptor four knockouts. Jeff Ravitch has them. He's supposed to send them, but they're in very high demand. We haven't gotten them yet, but uh, I'll show you the data that we have with these particular knockouts. First of all, when we transferred naive serum, we saw no difference. So these mice inherently don't have a lung phenotype, meaning we don't see higher levels of infection of any of them if we transfer naive serum. If you transfer immune serum, you can see the black ones are the wild types. We get this nice protection. The purple ones are the FC receptor one knockouts. They look the same. The red ones, um, are the FC receptor 2 knockouts pretty similar, but now we lose protection with the FC receptor 134 knockouts, and we also lose protection with FC receptor 3 knockouts. Perhaps not quite the same. They're not statistically different. Maybe if we did another 10 mice, they might be, but the differences are small. But you can see these two blue and green mice, which are the, these two, 3 knockout and the 134 knockout, we lose the protective activity of passively transferred antibody that was generated in the context of vaccination when we challenge with a heterologous SARS-CoV-2. And indeed, when we now look at, um, uh, when now we do the study, instead of as passive uh, immunization, we do active immunization, we see a similar phenotype. So in this case, we vaccinated wild type mice, FC receptor one knockouts, FC receptor three knockouts, FC receptor one, three, four knockouts, two doses of uh, mRNA 1273. We waited, we bled them to look for neutralizing activity, which I'll show you. And then we challenged with BA5. Um, and what you can see is that we did not see substantially different 
neutralizing activity or binding activity. I'm not showing you the data in these knockout mice. We were somewhat unexpected. We thought maybe we would see vast differences in the ability to generate antibodies in mice lacking FC receptors. But in fact, we really didn't see much in terms of the differences here, certainly not against BA5. It was almost identical. However, when we challenged these animals that had been vaccinated with BA5 now, you can see that the wild, the ones that have see the wild type animals were now protected against BA5 in the nasal turbinates and in the lungs. The FC receptor one knockouts also were protected, but we lost this protection in FC receptor three knockouts and FC receptor one, three, four knockouts. So the active immunization and passive immunization data matched in the context of challenge with a, a heterologous BA5 strain, suggesting as you get antigen shifting in the context of vaccination, a lot of the antibody protection is actually mediated or requires, let's say, uh, FC receptors, in particular in the mouse FC receptor three. So what FC receptor cell is mediating this protection? So we did a lot of flow cytometry analysis. We did depletion analysis. I'll just first show you that in this case, with the vaccinate, uh, with the passive transfer and uh, studies with BA5, when we looked by depleting with GR1, which depletes both neutrophils and monocytes, in contrast to the therapeutic studies that we saw with the monoclonal antibody, we really didn't see any difference in protection. We saw both of these were able to protect against infection, regardless of whether you had monocytes or neutrophils. The neutrophils were completely depleted. The monocytes were depleted by about 95%. However, when, when we depleted, this is my last data slide. Okay, okay. When we depleted um, alveolar macrophages, here's the depletion of alveolar macrophages. We don't deplete really any other cells substantially. You can see now here in the lung uh, is the protection mediated by um, uh, the, immune, the immune serum. And now we lose this protection when we uh, deplete alveolar macrophages, suggesting that alveolar macrophages and FC receptor three are critical for this. So let me summarize the work protection in vivo against heterologous viruses after passive transfer requires FC receptors, but not C1Q. It also requires FC receptor 3 as a dominant FC receptor. Protection uh, in vivo by serum antibodies against BA5 requires alveolar macrophages. And so the ongoing studies are still to determine mechanism of action. How is this protection occurring? Can we modify the FC of antibodies in some way or the antigens to improve outcome? And also, how does glycosylation of the antibodies after vaccination or after um, passive transfer, does this modify this process? And so I think I'm just going to uh, uh, skip this just to say we had lots of help from my lab, the uh, Veer, as well as um, uh, David Fremont's laboratory. And I'll stop there and answer questions if there are any. Tour de force, Mike. Thank you. That was really extraordinary. So we have a large audience. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. And I'm happy to, um, you know, read them to Mike and have him answer them. But maybe I'll start off with a few questions, Mike. So so the um, in the first part with the, um, you know, clear evidence that the FC was important for the therapeutic impact of the antibody um, and really showing the level of inflammation. Do you think that that's just a clearance mechanism, no virus, no inflammation, or do you think there's also some inhibitory anti-inflammatory activities that are critical to the FC function? So just really thinking, is it just purely mopping up or is there more to that kind of balancing the overall response in the tissue? Yeah. So for the sake of time, I didn't show the data. We it's in the original paper, well, but we did an RNA-seq analysis of this, and we actually saw very, very disparate um, profiles uh, of the uh, uh, of the transcriptional profiles associated with antibodies in the presence of those monocytes uh, being there. And so the program, we think probably is that there are myeloid cells that are being programmed by via their FC receptor um, uh, uh, interactions and engagement, which have better wound healing or repair processes. That's what actually came up in addition to uh, anything else. We don't think it's a clearance phenotype because the further out we went, we still had clinical benefit, but we had no difference, absolutely no difference in viral load. So I do think that they're shaping uh, the environment, the uh, reparative environment, as well as uh, you know the disease environment and having a separate impact by that. Route. And have you, have you done any proteomics or lipidomics in the lung space, just to ask the question, if they're basically just changing that milieu in some way? Because I mean, it, it's so compelling. We've only done transcriptional analysis. We haven't done okay. any other analysis, uh, any other omics analysis. Okay. Um, and then I guess, I guess, you know, one of my questions, of course, is, you know, we saw a lot of, uh, um, in the human correlates analysis, we saw a lot of work, like a lot of evidence that neutrophils might be important. And, you know, neutrophils in mice and, hu and humans are quite different, especially in their FC receptor expression profiles. And so um, as you think about that, um, you know, 
can, can you imagine that this monocyte phenotype is, you know, part of the overall story? Or do you think that it's a different axis of immun immunity compared to what neutrophils might be doing in humans? I mean, because they're both obviously going to have opsonophagocytic immune regulatory functions. Um, they're just, you know, really different, even in the FCR knock in mice, right? Neutrophils are just different in mice. I, I agree. They're different. And, um, you know, the transgenic mice will help us a little bit, although I still don't know if the neutrophils are behaving exactly the same way. I, I, I have some reservations about that. And so I think that um, we may be able to establish some models using this data, and then ultimately we're going to have to actually see how it actually compares to what we see in humans. But, you know, I, 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 I'm hesitant to make generalizations except to say the data that we showed in the models that we looked at didn't see a particularly profound protective phenotype associated with neutrophils. That said, you know, I think we have to be a little careful. Um, okay, and you do have a question, which actually, I have two questions, okay? We'll go first with the anonymous attendees. So the question here is, um, have you looked at target at, at alveolar macrophages for the monoclonal therapeutics? Do you know if they're involved in that biology? Yeah, so um, uh, we do have some preliminary data suggesting that alveolar macrophages also are having a role in the context of the monoclonals. So um, we, we've we um, been doing that in the context of the transgenic mice, um, uh, so the human transgenic ones. In that setting, um, uh, with certain antibodies that have mm -hmm. obviously uh, not as dominant neutralizing activity, we definitely see a role for alveolar max. And when we deplete them, we lose the activity. Um, interestingly, we don't set the baseline differently. It's not like there's much more virus uh, inherently in those animals. It's just we lose the protective activity of the antibodies. Okay. And you got one more from Randy Tressler. Um, of course, the therapeutics guy asking the question, did you evaluate how FC binding activity impacts the half-life of the antibodies? So I guess, does the, um, does the viewer antibody have a half-life deficit? Yeah, we did. We did careful half-life analysis, paired analysis, wild type versus mutants. And we saw no difference in, we looked both in blood and in tissue as well, in perfused tissue, and we had the same level. So the antibodies that we used in the mice that we used, either human to human, mouse to mouse, human to mouse, all of them so far, the paired ones, we've not seen differences, let's say with Lala PG versus wild type or GRLR versus wild type. I suspect there are some that will have impacts, but these particular ones, we did not see substantive uh, level differences or tissue distribution differences. So that's not an explanation. We we did look at that. Okay, and last, 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 and then we'll go to, to, to the next speaker. It's just a question. I'm not sure if I fully understand it, but did you look at T-cell depletions at all in any of the mice because they could potentially interact with antibodies? Yeah, so um, the, I think the T-cell is not direct. The T-cell is an indirect product of the antigen presentation. So the idea is that uh, antibodies might enhance antigen presentation um, uh, through by uh, internalization, and that would trigger CD8 T cell responses. And I think that's the data that um, uh, both Jeff Ravitch and uh, Skip published on a flu paper that was in Nature uh, not that long ago. And um, we looked at CD8 T cell depletions, and we saw a small benefit, a small loss of the activity. Um, in I sort of pointed it out um, in 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 the viral load, especially it didn't translate into the clinical phenotype, but we actually did lose some of the protection. Um, uh, at the day one, uh, uh, at, at, when we administered antibody at day one, looking late at day seven or eight, if we depleted CD8 T cells. So I do think there is also a role for CD8 T cells. It may be model dependent when you look and how you look, but my gestalt is from our data that at least in the mice, CD8 T cells have a, a role. I, I don't know how much, but they definitely have a role. Monocytes have a role depending upon when you administer things and alveolar macrophages have a role. And FCR3 is important whether FCR4 is important or not remains to be uh, understood. Amazing. Thank you, Mike. As always, total legendary. Okay, um, so we're gonna go to our next speaker. Um, and then if you do have, for the audience, if you do have more questions for Mike, please put them in the Q&A and hopefully Mike can continue to answer questions. Um, but now we, are, um, we have a real treat for our second speaker for this afternoon. Um, and so um, Dr. Robert Kimberly is really, I think probably one of the, um, people who have started this field is the way that I would put it. Um, Dr. Kimberly is a rheumatologist by training, clinical rheumatologist uh, that works in immunology and human genetics. And I think that um, Bob is really one of the first people that began to understand how human variation in FC receptors really ends up playing a part in the manifestation of different rheumatological conditions, and particularly in conditions that are driven by inflammatory antibody um, uh, pathologies. And so Bob's work has really been, I think, at the foundation 
of much of the work that we have um, you know, used to inspire so many of the animal models that we've developed in understanding how we can engineer monoclonals to have broader effects across different populations. His work has really been absolutely pivotal in really helping us to understand why we see variation in the response in the humoral immune response across populations at a global level um, and really helps us understand really how it is that we have evolved these very sophisticated multifunctional immune responses responses where antibodies leverage immunity in different ways, um, really by just looking in and how we have um, evolved this variation within this unique system of receptors that interact with antibodies. And so with um, that introduction in mind, we are just you know so delighted and so privileged to have um, Bob come and present to us today. And he will take us on a hopefully a little bit of a voyage of understanding really how um, genetic variation in FC receptors really essentially influences human health and disease. So with that, Bob, the podium is yours. Kelly, thanks very much. Let me see if I can get us, whoops, that screen share didn't get me what I was hoping to do. Can you see my screen? Not, not yet, no. Okay, let me do, this is the one I want. Great, now we see it. Okay, do you have it in the right mode? It's not, it's uh, not in presentation yet. Okay. Now it is. Okay, and you're seeing the full screen? Yes, perfect, take okay. it away. Thanks so much. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to, to join this uh, series of presentations. I've enjoyed it very much. I've had a chance to uh, uh, listen in, sometimes ask questions for many of the presentations. And, and Mike, thank you very much for setting up the importance of FC receptors. Uh, it really is the perfect entree to the comments that I'd like to make. I'm gonna take a slightly different tack. Um, first of all, I'm gonna provide a little bit more of perspective on human FC receptors wherever possible the work I'm going to point to is human-based, although I do understand the importance of model systems. And I'm also going to start with the thank yous. And the thank yous really are to the major sponsors of our work over the last good number of years, all NIH institutes and more colleagues across not only the United States and North America, but Europe and uh, the Far East as well. And I'd like to thank everybody for this opportunity. So what's the landscape that I'd like to talk about today? Well, we've had some wonderful presentations about the importance of target recognition, um, antigen recognition, neutralization. We've talked about uh, the role of the FC piece of immunoglobulin, uh, not only for ligand binding, um, but also for complement deposition. And we've had a number of presentations about signal initiated actions whether they be in myeloid cells or lymphoid cells. And I've listed here a number of the uh, different uh, activities that have been talked about. Um, but really what my goal today is to take a look at the gap. And that's the signal transducer itself. Which ones, how many, which subvariants, what post-translational modifications. And I think what that teaches us is that there's diversity on many levels, uh, not only in terms of target, in terms of the FC piece and how it may bind, in terms of the cells, but also the nature of the signal transducer itself. So the gap, a number of signal transducers, FC receptors, and typically when people talk about FC receptors, uh, they talk about the low affinity cluster. This is a reference to the human uh, cluster, and they talk about CD16 or FCR3, both the A form and the B form. And they talk about CD32 or FCR2, three different forms, uh, A, B, and C. But I'd remind us that there is a high affinity receptor um, in humans. It's CD64 or FCR1, which in many presentations may not receive quite the same amount of emphasis. But Galit, you would remind us that we shouldn't forget uh, FC alpha R1, uh, which binds IgA. And just as a quick reminder, 
although those are typically the, the receptors that we talk about, there are other uh, cell surface molecules which can bind uh, IgA um, as their ligand. Okay, in these uh, FC receptors, by their very name, we're sort of presuming that their role is to bind uh, immunoglobulin. We talked about class, subclass, allotots. Gester talked about Ig polymorphisms a couple of presentations ago. Galit talked about swarms of antibody. And we've heard about the importance of antibodies today that are able to bind FC receptors. But I would remind us that these receptors also bind pentraxins. Uh, we usually think about CRP, but they also bind SAP. And CRP binds to all of the human FC receptors. And from some work that was uh, published by Peter Sun at the NIH, you can see uh, binding affinities between pentraxins and FC receptors in solution. The system that's used to assess the affinity of binding is really important because as you all know, pentraxins by their nature have five binding sites. So when you actually look at affinity or avidity is perhaps a better word, uh, there are issues not only of intrinsic one-to-one uh, -one binding, but also aggregation, the display, the mobility of the potential receptors in the plane of the membrane and so on. So does that make a difference? Does it make a difference whether these receptors bind to CRP? And if so, what might CRP do? And if I can get my cursor, um, and I'm not sure that the cursor is coming up on the screen, it's coming up on mine. But if no, we look at the left- uh, We're not seeing it. Okay, I'll, I'll just talk us through, Billy. Um, on the left-hand side of the presentation, you'll see down with activated neutrophils, which have been a topic today, it looks like CRP, in addition to IgG, actually enhances the respiratory burst. For monocytes, it appears to have no effect whatsoever. It may be that for non-activated neutrophils, there's no effect as well. When we look at the right-hand side of the uh, panel that's being displayed now and look at phagocytosis, for monocytes, there doesn't seem to be an effect uh, in the upper right-hand corner of the addition of CRP, although some might say, gee, it might look like it's even inhibitory a little bit, not statistically significant, but clearly for activated neutrophils, there does appear to be an acceleration or an amplification of phagocytosis. So the two ligands working together. Um, among these uh, low affinity uh, FC receptors in the human system, there are multiple alleles. And in this cartoon borrowed from Frontiers in Immunology, you'll see a number of the key sites, some of which Gestur talked about several presentations ago. Most notably, the two that are usually referred to are the histidine arginine um, in uh, CD32A or FCR2A and the valine phenylalanine in CD16A or FCR3A, because both of those um, influence the ligand binding site and the affinity for ligand and also subclass specificity in the case of FCR2A. But I would remind us in this figure that I showed you just a moment ago, when we look at CD64, there are also a number of different uh, genetic polymorphisms in CD64 as well. They are not as carefully explored as the polymorphisms in the uh, CD16 and CD32 um, families, but my hunch is that nature has preserved those for a reason. So here are some examples on the right-hand side of the, uh, a number of the single nucleotide polymorphisms that are in the low affinity alleles. Uh, and when we look at the functions that are influenced by these different alleles, we can go through a whole catalog of functions that alter ligand binding, that alter glycosylation, glycosylation sites, that influence through a number of different mechanisms, expression level, that alter the mobility of the receptor in the plane of the membrane and the ability to gain access to lipid rafts and also directly signal transduction. 
So I think as we talk about filling that gap, it's important to realize that there's a great deal of variation in that gap that may actually be important when we're looking at the human model system. And certainly general principles can be illustrated in other animal model systems but when we come to humans, we might want to look directly at that system per se. There's one in particular uh, allylic form that I would like to spend a moment talking about because it pertained directly to a vaccine response. And response to vaccination seems to be an important theme for this series of presentations. And this has to do with uh, uh, CD32C or FCGR2C. Uh, the open reading framer stop codon and the uh, extracellular domain uh, of the receptor and the importance of it in the vaccine response. So let me walk you quickly through this slide. When we look at the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see data which show that when there is open reading frame, um, there is expression of uh, FCR2C. Um, that is not otherwise seen in the context of a stop. This is true whether we're looking at U937 cells where it might be expected, but what is also important is in B cells because it was thought that um, FCR2C, which has high homology uh, with FCR2B, that um, 2B, uh, was the only receptor that was expressed on human B cells, but it turns out in the context of open reading frame, both are expressed. Why is this important? Because 2C is an activating receptor, not an inhibitory receptor. And so that might well change the biology of the B cell as two different receptors can be engaged on B cells from donors who have open reading frame. That's demonstrated in two ways. In the middle panel within the red square, here are the results of the uh, antibody response going back to an old cohort that we did uh, when anthrax vaccine was being developed. We were able to go back and genotype all of the donors that were done in the study. And when people were open reading frame homozygous, you can see in the open bars the level of antibody response, that's really at the level of detection of the assay. But when they're homozygous open reading frame, in fact, their antibody response is significantly higher. For those who have an interest in autoimmune disease and the relationship of SC receptor alleles and autoimmune phenotypes, the right-hand part of the slide demonstrates that in fact, in both European Americans and African Americans, with open reading frame, the probability of SLE is higher and in control groups. That suggests to us that not only for an intervention like vaccination, but something which some would say is spontaneous or at least occurs in a different way, that the genotype and repertoire of receptors displayed makes a difference in terms of clinical phenotype. So in addition to um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, of which there are a great number among these receptors. There's another mechanism for genetically based polymorphism in the um, low affinity human FC receptors, and that's copy number variation due to non-allelic homologous recombination. Um, the panel here illustrates that uh, the low affinity cluster is actually a segmental duplication with two paralogs that are highly homologous, evidence that there are both deletions and duplications of what are called CNRs. And in this illustration, it's CNR one, two, three, and four. We've been very interested in this because these CNRs, whether duplication or deletion, uh, we know based on previous work affects copy number. Uh, and copy number per se, in addition to regulatory elements, uh, obviously may influence the density of receptor expression on whatever your particular uh, cell of uh, query is. So we've been approaching this um, in a very large uh, human cohort using PacBio CCS. This is PacBio's newest technology. I'll simply say that for any of you 
um, who have had the opportunity to do long read sequencing with PacBio to CC it, the fidelity of the CCTS, CCS sequences are really quite remarkable. Um, and it, it has enabled us for the first time to actually assemble this region de novo. And among the things we're learning is that in addition to the original uh, four CNRs that were described in the literature some years ago, there really are a number of different variations of them. This is an example of some of the data that we have where the thicker part of the black bar represents sequence where we know it is related to the specific CNR and the thinner parts represent areas of ambiguity where because of the homology between the two reasons, we can't definitively define the boundaries of either the deletion or the duplication. There might be another way to illustrate this. And so I've just reshuffled the presentation of these CNRs and you can see as you go across the cluster, it looks very much like a sliding cassette. We've had this model in mind for quite some time. PacBio is now giving us the ability to define those. And um, as we recognize not only for coding, but regulatory regions in this uh, paralogous region, uh, we expect to have further insights in what is going to affect um, the copy number and the particular genotypes of the receptors expressed. Now you might ask whether these CNRs are common or not common. Um, and I'll draw our attention to the left-hand part of this slide in this uh, representation, which has similarities to the MLPA um, assays that were developed in Amsterdam. We took a somewhat different approach with a quantitative PCR approach and the two different axes that are on the left represent what I would call the standards uh, CNRs with the large uh, dark area in the center being normal and then having either duplication or deletion moving either way on the x-axis. But on the right-hand panel, what I'll point out is that there are a lot of donors. This is from a population that's about 6,200 people. We've assayed this way. There are a lot of donors that fall off of those two axes. What does that mean? About a third of us in both African-American and Caucasian populations are among those that fall off or fall outside of that standard uh, diploid, uh, no duplication, no deletion central point. Put another way, a third of us have major alterations in the genetic architecture of this region, and it may well have significant implications for which receptors are expressed at which density and with what genotypes. So theoretically, I guess this may be interesting, but I, you know, one of the questions we asked ourselves was, well, really, does this make any difference? This is from work from Amsterdam from a number of years ago, looking at the expression of CD32 on um, NK cells. And you can see on the left-hand side, um, really, um, not surprisingly, CD32 is expressed on NK cells. It's an activating receptor. But when there's um, FCR2 stop, there really should not be um, any expression of CD32 of a baseline control. And you'll see here in this small sampling, there are four individuals who are clearly expressing CD32. This must be FCR2B. Well, remember 2B is the inhibitory receptor. So this, the NK cells from those four individuals instead of expressing a CD32, which activates probably alongside uh, CD16 or FCR3A, these people have a receptor which inhibits. So from the NK cell perspective, its FC repertoire really can have multiple different combinations. It's CD16 or FCR3A can have a number of different binding site alleles or alleles which affect binding. It can have open reading frame or not. 
for 2C with concomitant expression is demonstrated in this slide. It can have, though I haven't shown you the data, uh, they can have a copy number variation through a CNR2, which can either delete or duplicate 3A expression. And we know expression varies according to the CNR2 status, but it also may have an FCR2B um, that comes along with CNR1. So there are many different mixes and matches. And it may be when we think about either therapeutic monoclonal antibodies or those processes where we're expecting NK cells to play an important physiologic role through the engagement of its FC receptors. I hope you can immediately see it's not a binary question of yes or no. It's really a very sophisticated question of what's the repertoire of receptors that that particular person NK cells are displaying. So what I'd like to do is spend a couple of minutes um, expanding the range of variations and combinations that we talk about. Uh, I've talked a little bit about ligands, ligand binding. Uh, we talked a lot about genetic variation and there's a lot in the literature for those who would like uh, to explore this a little bit more deeply. But I'd like to make three additional points. I'd like to talk about chain pairing. I'd like to talk a little bit about glycosylation of the receptor itself. And to remind us, as I did at the very beginning, there's more to this story than just IgGs. So um, gamma chain, uh, we know for the triple knockout mouse, um, they lack the common gamma chain. And on this slide, you'll see the sequence uh, for in human, uh, the common gamma chain. But I point out right below it, is the sequence for the uh, immunoreceptor tyrosine activation motif for human FCR2A. And you'll immediately note two differences. They're of different length. So if the model for docking to the tyrosine activation motif involves perhaps it's six sitting down in particular contact sites, you'll see immediately those sites are gonna be different. Um, in the two different receptors. So the receptors that are enabled by gamma chain and the receptor uh, 2A, which has a very different uh, segment length. The other is when you look carefully, you'll notice the charge is very different in the two. And taking advantage of this of a good number of years ago with very, um, with some of the initial experiments in this, uh, Alan Schreiber at Penn looked at the phagocytic capacity of both FCR2A in a transfection system compared to looking uh, to a chimeric uh, 2A uh, extracellular and transmembrane domain in a gamma chain on the inside. And you can see in his system, the level of activity was different. What are some of the ways that may happen? Over on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll note for human FC receptor gamma chain, You'll notice that there are a number of sites which can be serine, threonine, phosphorylated. We did a number of uh, point mutation experiments and transfection experiments to demonstrate that these sites and mutating them to non-phosphorylated residue, alanine residues in this case, makes a significant difference in terms of the ability of that gamma chain to mediate, in this case, IL-4 production or not. It also influences uh, calcium fluxes and a number of other uh, cell activities. But I would remind us that in, in addition to thinking about different structures of ITANs, that for FCR1, CD64, there's also the alpha chain cytoplasmic domain, which itself is very interesting. It's illustrated in panel A, well, you'll notice there are a number of sites which could be serine phosphorylated. Through a series of mutational experiments and chimeras, we've demonstrated that in fact, uh, they are actively serine phosphorylated upon uh, receptor cross-linking and the active kinase in this case is CK2. Not only that, but the ability of that receptor to engage 
band 4.1G, which is part of the cytoskeletal structure of the cell, is dependent upon that serine phosphorylation. Why does this make a difference? Well, when we were talking about could we modulate what the cell's response is when the receptor is engaged, does it go to a recycling and a representation? Does it go to a lysosomal vacuole? Or what is its intracellular trafficking pattern? Likely the ability or lack thereof to engage the cytoskeleton productively is very important. Here's an example of that um, where we're looking at co-localization of um, FCR1 to uh, lipid rafts. And you can see when it's wild type, it's able to co-localize. When the receptor is unable to be serine phosphorylated, um, it does not co-localize. And when you look at the uh, uh, production of certain cytokines, you'll see that the same um, role of the tail and its ability to influence the cytokine repertoire that is expressed um, is clearly important. But the story is not limited um, just to CD64. Another um, FC receptor, which pairs with gamma chain is CD16, FCR3A. We know that happens in the mouse. We certainly know that happens in human. I'm going to go through this uh, fairly quickly, and I apologize if this is not immediately apparent, but I'm going to start this time over on the right-hand side uh, with a cartoon. Unlike uh, CD64, which has CK2 uh, phosphorylation uh, sites, uh, CD16 has PKC phosphorylation site, a classical one. And in the panels, both on the right and in the middle, um, those sites are phosphorylated. We know they are phosphorylated by PKC, and we know that that phosphorylation is influenced by S100A4. Does that make a difference? It does because it also influences the signal that's actually being transmitted by the FC receptor of common gamma chain. And so you can have, you can begin to skew the signaling from this receptor down two different pathways, depending upon the phosphorylation state of CD16A. The lesson we take from this is even though both CD64 and CD16 engage the common gamma chain, the repertoire of signaling that they actually initiate may well be subtly different. And one of the opportunities for all of us is to understand what the implications of that might be, whether it's for antigen processing for a vaccine response, whether it's how um, uptake uh, viruses go to lysosomal pathways for destruction, or whatever it may be in cell-mediated cytotoxicity. Another point, um, and this is just one slide on glycosylation. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about glycosylation of uh, immunoglobulin and the importance of that. And I think that's very well established. But perhaps a little less appreciated is the glycosylation of the FC receptor itself is also important. This was probably first demonstrated for CD16B, which is the GPI anchored uh, CD16 on new human neutrophils. Uh, not perhaps in other species. But what I'd like to talk about is the glycosylation of the alpha chain uh, CD16 as expressed on NK cells. The point of this particular slide, and I'll draw our attention to panel B, where we're in the lower left-hand corner, where we're looking at the ability of um, myeloma proteins to block a monoclonal antibody called 3G8, which binds specifically to the ligand binding site. The idea was that antibody, free antibody, which is able to bind to the ligand binding site would compete with and perhaps inhibit the binding of 3G8. The point of this slide is shown by the red arrow where um, the binding of IgG1 in NK cells is, uh, or 
the binding of 3G8 is significantly blocked um, by IgG1, suggesting that it's actually quite a high affinity receptor, unlike cultured monocytes, uh, which are over on the right-hand side of that panel and very, very different from a neutrophils and the CD16B that's on those. So what difference might that make? Well, one is there's interest in what the composition is. These studies were actually done at a time when glycomics were in their early stage. And so these studies were all done with lectins. Um, but it was very clear that NK cells have high mannose uh, glycosylation, unlike neutrophils, unlike monocytes. But there may be a biologic implication. And that is FCR3A on NK cells might have two different mechanisms of being a very high affinity receptor. One we've talked about, which is the genetic variation, but the other is the glycosylation, suggesting that both 3A on NK and FCR1A on monocytes and neutrophils are two high affinity receptors in human systems. And perhaps this speaks to the fact that depending upon which cell type you're looking at, that a high affinity receptor is important for ADCC. Okay, final comments. What I'd like to do is just make a couple of quick comments about IgA and its receptor in humans called FCAR or CD89. Um, there are a number of polymorphisms um, in uh, genetic polymorphisms, single nucleotide polymorphisms in FCAR in the human system, and they're illustrated in panel A. But I'm going to talk about um, position uh, 238, 248, excuse me, um, where it's serine or glycine, depending upon which allele that you have. And the purpose of these experiments was to show that whether we're looking at degranulation or calcium fluxes, the um, magnitude of the response is different, whether you're a glycine or you're a serine. And that's really important because in work that I will show you uh, on this slide and Galit, I'm just about through with the deck. Um, when we've looked in uh, various systems, the serine when stimulated is actually inhibitory to cell functions rather than stimulatory like the glycine. Now, this as we think about it is sort of interesting because in the IgG system, you have activating receptors and inhibitory receptors. In the human IgA system, I would point out is very different from mouse. Um, you have activating and you have inhibiting alleles, which gives an interesting twist for how do you regulate this. There's a whole bunch in CD89 about gamma chain pairing and the implications of that, which I can't go into. So I'd like to wrap up with two slides. First of all, why is any of this important? Why are these isoforms and their function important? And I'd like to say it's because we know they directly affect clinical phenotype. I've chosen just four examples. Infectious disease, very clear that the response, the uh, to encapsulated bacteria, usually the example is H flu, is highly dependent upon which allele of FCR2A you have. In autoimmune disease, a number of autoantibody-mediated phenotypes, our particular interest is lupus, is clearly influenced by both FCR2A as well as FCR3A. Therapeutic monoclonal antibodies, first-generation antibody rituximab, huge difference in response of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, depending upon your genotype. And I'd like to think even in the vaccine response um, with the example of the 2C open reading frame. So finally, some questions for us to think about um, where I don't think we really know the answer. And I would ask, suggest that we think about, does a CNR1 deletion diminish the efficiency of ablated monoclonal antibodies. This would be by the positioning of 2B on NK cells. As I've already suggested, should we really be thinking about this concept of high affinity receptors differently and adding 3A on NK cells to promote ADCC 
for IGA and FCAR, perhaps its role is neutralization of mucosal barriers, but because it then can pair with gamma chain under certain circumstances, maybe systemically it's very much involved in inflammation. This would point immediately to a role for neutrophils. And because we know now that the, the alpha chains are regulated differently by different uh, uh, serine kinases, can we begin to manipulate beneficially the cell response through pharmacologic intervention that might then steer the response to the ligand in a way that's more beneficial for the host? So with that, I will say I'm, I decided there are a number of people over the years we've worked with, and I've reached back into the archives to where this started, Galit, as you pointed out. There was a group, an international group of people, and I think I see at least three different nations on this raft having fun at one of the FACIB summer conferences in Colorado. And the fun continues, and it continues in part because the variations in the way these receptors work, I think are very important for human biology. So with that, I'll say thank you. And if there's time, be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Bob. That was really wonderful. And it's, uh, it's great to see where it all began on the White Rapids. So that, that, that is the voyage I think we are all on. Um, so maybe I can start and I can ask the audience if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, but maybe I can begin, you know, because I'm just fascinated by um, all this variation, both at the, um, you know, single nucleotide polymorphic level, as well as at the copy number variation. And so do you see that in certain populations, there's more of one versus the other? Um, just out of curiosity, because, you know, we do see that there are like a third of the population that has this, you know, copy number variation. I think that the polymorphisms are quite probably not quite as frequent, or maybe some of them are quite as frequent, but do we see that, that some of, um, some populations have been under different pressure by viruses or by bacteria over evolution that has pushed us in one direction or another, really trying to think through, you know, where, evolution has kind of put FC receptors to respond to pathogens or to um, autoimmune insults? So Galit, the, the question is a really important one and um, one to which we only have a partial answer. As you know, the best way to do this would actually be to go to different global locations where you don't have as much population admixture and can examine the representation of different uh, alleles in different populations. Um, and that really hasn't been done. Mm. We have done that in North America. And I think it is clear that persons who have uh, African ancestry are more likely to have a greater degree of variation. But having said that, the variation is in all of us. I think the, the whatever adaptive advantage was conferred on populations through these variants, I think that advantage was at work a long, long time ago. Fascinating. So, as a family of man, our sameness far outweighs our differences. I think there's some uh, potential uh, interesting genetic uh, archaeology that can be done to look at this. Um, okay, there's two questions for you, and I want to make sure I get to them because the audience is as okay. important, uh, of course. Um, so, so the first question is: Do you have any ideas about the frequency of the 2C ORF um, polymorphism in our general population? So, how how frequent is that? Um, that I guess I guess the yeah. the polymorphism. So the the answer is yes. Um, and when you go into a number of the public databases, you will see a little bit of a variation in that. And that partly addresses the question you asked, Delete. But I would say the allele frequency is about uh, 0 0.1. 0 0.1. Oh, wow. Rare. Okay. I guess not so rare, but but still low numbers. Um, okay. The next question, um, I'm not, it, it's a... Uh, Interesting. So, so there are IG one and IG twos in humans. Does one prefer FC alpha receptor? I think that's known. Um, and IG one is considered less inflammatory compared to A two. And does that potentially uh, relate to that binding? So our perspective is that while there may be differences in the ligand, so IgA one and two, 
Um, what may not be fully appreciated is how powerful uh, the inhibitory allele of EPCAR actually is. I, I think we know the mechanism of that. Um, it is a phosphorylation dependent. So I think what we really have in the IgA system, and this um, uh, has not yet been published, I think we actually have, we often talk about tyrosine phosphorylation and a tyrosine base switch. I think we also have, at least in the IgA system, uh, a serine-based inhibitory motif, just like we have a tyrosine activation motif and a tyrosine inhibition motif. I think that is going to be the dominant source of inhibition with IgA. Great. And then, and then the follow-on question from that, I think from the same person, is um, that that uh, FC the FCAR um, there's a short form and a long form. Um, does each form have the same variants? Are they shared? So the particular variant I talked about, uh, the answer is yes. Um, I, the IGA, the human IGA receptor, CD89, actually has a number of variants, which uh, we haven't talked about today. Um, it also has a lot of variation in um, glycosylation of its extracellular domain and a number of very different regulatory mechanisms, including inside out signaling. So the system is remarkably sophisticated, um, but at least one dominant property is this inhibitory motif. And, and going back to this concept of um, glycosylation being critical for regulating receptor um, interaction with the ligand, I suppose you know much of the work is done in resting states. And so we are not capturing probably the full spectrum of the activation potential or profiles. Would that be consistent with, um, you know, I guess where you're thinking glycosylation is playing an important role where it's changing under inflammatory circumstances or potentially in different tissues. And that adds another form of regulation of interaction with the ligand and driving immunological signaling. So uh, I might answer the question on, on two levels. One is uh, the question, um, if I may reframe, is, is there cell type specific glycosylation? And the answer I think is unequivocally, yes, there is. And CD16A is glycosylated differently in NK cells and monocytes. And it makes a difference in terms of the affinity um, and therefore also the avidity of the receptor for ligand. The second question might be a much more subtle one, and that might be, does the nature of glycosylation in any given cell type vary as the cell is activated or is involved in an inflammatory milieu? So is there not only cell type specific, but context influenced glycosylation? I think that's a fascinating question, but we have no information on that at all. Okay, well, food for thought, I guess, for, for additional um, assays. And then going back to the patraxins, if I can just go back to that for, at okay. the beginning, because I think that that was really critically important. You know, very few of the assays that are done classically take that additional binding into consideration. Um, but we know that CRP, for example, increases in many inflammatory states, including, you know, with monoclonal therapeutic um, treatment. Do you, do you know of any studies, um, Bob, where folks have looked at the potential confounding effect of CRP fluctuations or levels and monoclonal therapeutic efficacy? Is there some sort of com competition or um, clinical impact of having, you know, two systems working at the same time? And are they co-regulating each other, I guess, is the question. Because I think that, that was maybe a very important point at the beginning. Yes. Uh... Khalid, I, I would love to have the answer to that, to those questions, but uh, I'll answer again uh, in several ways. I think, first of all, when one looks at uh, binding studies, whether they're binding in competition or binding in enhancement of receptor function, it's important to realize that um, CRP needs a very, um, how should I say, thoughtful and delicate experimental touch because 
Uh, I think most of the time it's operating as a pentamer, but in vitro, it can be denatured pretty quickly. And so you can get results that are just not relevant. Um, there are other ways of thinking about that. And that could be, does the inflammatory milieu is part of that actually changing the nature of CRP? So you're changing the nature of the interaction between immunoglobulin and CRP. I don't think that's been studied, but I think it's an important question to ask. And then this sort of integrative question that you were asking, um, and this could be in the context of severe COVID where there might be studies of yeah. um, antibodies and CRP level and things like that. Um, I don't know if people have looked at that interaction. So I think that will be very they, interesting. They, they have not. And yeah. how to do that in, in a rigorous and thoughtful way is really important. It, well, it's, I, another, it's another example, though, I would caution those who use animal models. Mouse doesn't have CRP. Exactly. So if in human CRP is important, our bias is it probably is. Um, that's why we have it. Um, you just need to keep in mind that some systems do not make CRP. And so we use every... It's important. That's it's right. It's important. Okay. Um, so Bob, I, I, I hate to cut you off because I think we could go on forever, but I'm going to just ask you if you don't mind just putting down your screen, um, if you can stop sharing. And then I think we're going to have Courtney just show one quick slide, but I'm going to thank you ever so much for your time. I'm going to thank Mike for his time. This was phenomenally informative. Um, it was really a tour de force from the two speakers. I want to remind you all that we do have one more seminar coming up. Um, Mark Craig is going to speak on Wednesday, March 1st. So please Please do attend. Um, we are really excited to have him talk about some antibody engineering lessons from, you know, the clinical development space. Um, and with that, um, it's 329 and we're going to give you all one minute back to enjoy your day and to just like think about all this wonderful information and how we're going to use this to move the field forward. So thank you to the speakers and thank you to the attendees. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.